I'm introduced, the ideas of capitalism, arguments for capitalism, uh, the real world implications of capitalism, what we might call crony capitalism. What about the other option? What about instead of private property rights, we had collective property rights, collectivism. What if we all share in property rights? What if we do it all together? There's a couple different fundamental forms of collectivism. First is voluntary collectivism. It may be that you are already the member or have been in your life a member of a voluntary collective. In a lot of ways, most families operate like a voluntary communal or collective society. So, you know, back at home, I've got a wife and a little baby son. I really do, in a sense, follow that Marxist notion of from each according to ability to each according to need, right? Uh, my little baby son, really not able to pull his weight yet. He kind of just hangs out and I feed him a lot. I, I, don't, I don't expect a lot out of him. I don't expect him to work in order to uh, eat and have shelter. I uh, basically just... You know, I, I'm a, in a sense, I, I, I just work for whatever his whims are. When he cries, I come running to help him out, even when he may not even need anything. Uh, so I'm definitely, you know, it's in my ability and my duty to do that. And I chose to, to make that little baby and I'm choosing to uh, fulfill that obligation that I've made. We were all, you know, we all chose to be part of it. I guess he didn't, but such is the nature of parents and kids, I suppose. But we've got this voluntary collective where everybody agreed to share ownership of everything and share uh, and pursue our shared interests. So the key idea here is that there's free entry and exit. There, you can enter this collective if you want to, and you can leave if you want to. So yeah, I guess, you know, my son didn't enter of his free volition, but when he gets to a certain age, if he doesn't want to be involved in our collective, he can, he can split if he wants to, right? Maybe the family example isn't perfect. Perhaps a better example maybe is like uh, religious groups that choose to create communal societies. Think perhaps the Amish, uh, groups like this. Um, in the 1800s, certainly, uh, the Mormons engaged in this. They wanted to create a, a communal society um, to live and work together, right? Uh, and when you do that, when you do that voluntarily, you say, hey, I want to create a society and we're all going to share everything and work together to our, to our common interest. Well, that's voluntary collectivism. And to be very clear, if that's what you want to do, you can do that right now in the United States. If you want to be in a voluntary collective, if you want to go uh, join a religious sect out in the woods or uh, in, you know, maybe a non-religious sect out in the woods where you know, everybody just tills the soil and you know, we all contribute to the shelter and the food and whatnot, that's an option. That's an option on the table for you. So keep that in mind. This is a little different than Involuntary collectivism. Shared ownership of property based on force. You don't get to leave. You don't have a right to disagree with the collective. You are part of this system whether you want to be or not. Um, so historically, the Soviet Union would have been a collective like this. Today, North Korea and Cuba are collectives of this type. Critically, you can't leave. You didn't necessarily, perhaps you wanted to join, but even if you want to leave, you can't. This picture is from the Berlin Wall in Germany, what's left of it, the memorial to the Berlin Wall. And these are pictures of people that died. A lot of people don't actually know what the Berlin Wall was, what its purpose was. So, you, you know, you got... part of Berlin that is run by the West, right, that is uh, occupied by the government's 
of the West and part that is uh, occupied by the Soviet Union. And it turns out a good chunk of people that were in the part of Germany that was occupied by the Soviet Union, they wanted to leave and join the part that was uh, occupied by the West. That was the part that was capitalist in many sense, uh, you know, to a, to a great degree. Well, they weren't allowed. The Berlin Wall was not meant to keep people out, as most walls, we may perceive, are meant to do. I mean, maybe you build a wall around your backyard or a fence. It might be to keep people, or prying eyes at least, out. The purpose of the Berlin Wall was to keep people in, right? To keep people from going out of East Berlin and into West Berlin. These people all died trying to get out, trying to get out of East Berlin and into West Berlin. And that is truly horrific. But it brings us to this big idea, which is socialism is common ownership of the factors of production, right? Shared ownership of the factors of production. Well, what are the factors of production? Land, the physical resources of the earth. Capital, the physical tools and equipment of our you know, factories and machines that we use to produce goods and services. And labor, manpower, workers. That's part of the factors of production. And that has to be commonly held for socialism to work. So we can't, we can't permit people to leave. Uh, one of the first things that Castro did when he comes into power in Cuba, he starts destroying boats, very famously. Um, obviously, North Korea, you are not permitted to leave. East, German, East Germany and East Berlin, you were not permitted to leave, to flee to the West, because... You're part of the society. We can't have the, the factors of production just leaving. We can't have our natural resources, including the people, just fleeing because that diminishes the collective. You're part of this, whether you want to be or not, right? So it's an economic system where the factors of production are held in common. Decisions on who gets what, what we're going to make, and how we're going to make it, are made in common. So this has almost always been done by a government. Sometimes that government is supported by elections, although typically we may not see that. Uh, usually it's, uh, you know, even if there are elections, maybe uh, we might be a little skeptical of the electoral results, for example, like in a place like Cuba or China, right? So where does this, this idea of socialism come from? Uh, well, communal societies have existed for a very, very long time. Formalized philosophy of socialism comes to us from uh, 19th century France. That's where the term socialism comes to us from. Um, Marx and Engels really get into a philosophical school of uh, communism and socialism, which they do distinguish from one another, and this guiding principle of from each according to ability to each according to need, we're all going to share in the work, and we're all going to share in the output, the product of this work. So a little bit of a philosophy primer on Marx. It's been said that one cannot understand Marx without first understanding Hegel. Uh, Hegel is in many ways the kind of philosophical forebearer for Marx. He says a lot of things that Marx really buys into and Marx builds on his ideas. So to describe, uh, Georg he Hegel puts forth this dialectic, this method of analysis, this way of seeing the world. And he sees constant change and conflict between different ideas. And in his work, he presents it like this. There is a thesis, an idea. There is the opposite, antithesis. But when taken together, the, the conflict between these ideas produces some deeper truth in a lot of ways. 
So, give a couple examples here. The thesis of being, existence. We have our perception of existence through our senses. That is something we have to take into account. We also have this radical opposite idea of nothingness, but the conflict between these is the, the process of becoming, right? This is that dialectic showing itself. Uh, perhaps more enlightening, the idea of, you know, kind of applying this to political philosophy, this idea of, okay, one extreme, slavery, the other extreme, this radical freedom where you can do literally whatever you want all the time, conflict between these, between absolute deprival of self-determination and absolute free will with limitless self-determination is an enlightened freedom or, or a bounded freedom where you're free to do some stuff or some said the freedom to do the right thing, perhaps. Uh, as Trotsky, famous, of course, uh, in the Soviet Union, famous thinker and politician in the Soviet Union, early Soviet Union, he said Hegel's logic is the logic of evolution. So, again, competition between ideas, fighting each other out into this kind of next idea. Yeah? Okay. Hopefully that made some kind of sense. Hegel, definitely a very heady thinker. Marx takes Hegel's dialectic, and he says, through research, data-driven research about history and the way the world has grown up until his point, he's writing in the mid-1800s, we can describe a flow of history, a, a movement of history, and he describes this as the historical dialectic. So, we ask what is the state of nature? Before government, before society, how do human beings treat each other? Marx believes before government, everybody lives in peaceful communes. This idea of we're all going to share, we're all going to look out for each other's interests, this is Marx's ideas without government, peaceful communes in society. Then government enters, and through conflict, the winning side of this conflict oppresses everybody else, so the, the losers. And we get this, uh, this very extreme form of slavery where after we leave communal society, conflict drives us to slavery, where there's an upper class and a lower class, the owners and the slaves, and that is our first era of history to Marx. And then class struggle, struggle between the slaves and the owners drives us to our next phase of history. Marx describes as serfdom, sort of what you might see in kind of medieval Europe sort of thing, where, okay, you're no longer a slave per se, You've, you're, there's more kind of more rights and freedoms allowed you, but you're certainly not, uh, you know, uh, perfectly within free will on the other side of things. Conflict between the classes led to capitalism. And when he's writing in the 1800s, Marx says, this is the era of society that I'm in right now. So he's de detailing history's past and describing almost prophetically what he believes is coming in the future of history. And he believes that you can make this prediction by studying data and evidence from history and by considering class struggle. So he believes class struggle brought us from slavery into serfdom from serfdom into capitalism, and you could, should be able to see this trend of the lower classes gaining more power, and he predicts in the fourth stage a revolution to socialism. 
When Marx uses the term socialism, he's referring to a government-run collective. Such that there is a government that holds the means of production and decides what to produce, how to produce it, and to whom the product goes. So the transition from capitalism to his ideal state of communism has this middle, br this bridge state of socialism, which is government run collective. So the, the factors of production owned by government. And then another class struggle pushes us from government run collective to a commune, almost as if we've come full circle. And to Marx, communism should not have a government. Socialism, the government owns the factors of production, but in the ultimate outcome of history, we return to a communal society where there is no government needed. People naturally give according to ability and take according to need without the need for a government. Really interesting stuff. This more or less, give my little imperfect description of Marx's historic dialectic. You can read more about that, of course, in uh, his works, Das Kapital, and more famously, The Communist Manifesto. Let's talk a little bit about The Communist Manifesto. Uh, it's really not that long, and I believe it's... Uh, should be freely available on the internet if you wanted to read it. It's about, I don't know, 100 pages, a little less, something like that. Uh, could be read in an afternoon if you were curious. Uh, it's written by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, and it provides a criticism of modern capitalism. Capitalism, of course, at this time in the mid-1800s. And they describe an alienation from the worker and the product of their labor. You're going to work all day at the 18, 1800s equivalent of Walmart. Walmart's going to make all this money. They're going to sell all these goods and services. You don't get that money. You don't get those goods and services. You get a wage. Just, oh, here's your money for your time. And he says that you're being alienated from the products of your labor that are created. Which is, there might be some validity to that. Maybe there's some uh, nugget of truth to that. He criticizes marriage. He says, argues that marriage in a capitalist society is really not based on love, but based on money. It's, it's all about kind of, it's a financial relationship. It's not a, uh, you know, emotional relationship. And of course, he has some very strong criticisms of religion. He says religion is just here to uh, kind of, as the, you know, the famous quote, although I believe misattributed, but the idea is still there that religion is pacifying the masses such that they do not rise up against their tyrannical uh, bourgeois overlords, right? And the Communist Manifesto famously closes with this call to action. Workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. That's bold. So what kind of stuff does the Manifesto call for? Um, abolition of land ownership. Obviously, land, one of the factors of production, so people can't own that. It has to be owned by the collective, right? Abolition of inheritance. Uh, you shouldn't be able to pass property on to your children. Obligation of all to work. So everybody has to work. And remember at this time, Marx is seeing people that are not working. And this is long before people, you know, are collecting on the, you know, not to weigh in on any of this, but the perception that people are, this is long before the perception that uh, people are not working, just sitting on the government dole. No, this is the bourgeoisie, the rich people are sitting, not working, just collecting money from their inheritances 
and from their businesses that they own without really contributing. Everybody's got to work, says Mark. And uh, one of the more unique ideas is the combination of agricultural and manufacturing kind of production and an abolition of the distinction between city and country, between urban areas and rural areas. Uh, spreading people out equally would be the goal described in the Communist Manifesto. Obviously, cities uh, and rural areas may lead to some pretty serious inequalities which you guys might be aware of. So those were some of the ideas that Marx put forward. Uh, obviously, it's not a whole class about Marx, but a lot of neat ideas there. Talk a little bit about the philosophical ideas that guided him, his, his kind of broad philosophy, and some of the specific ideas that he was calling for. So why is collectivism good? Well, you can choose to live in a collective, it often sounds nice to engage in cooperation. What if we all work together? Why do we have to compete with one another? You know, uh, families are really communes, as I described at the start of this of this lecture. Well, what's wrong with that? I like my my family. You guys might like your families, maybe not, but well, maybe you do. Wouldn't it be better if our society was more familial, more communal in that way? So why is socialism superior to capitalism? Well, here's a few arguments for that. Capitalism doesn't have any order. It's anarchy. It's this state of uh, creative destruction we've talked about, where there's competition between all these companies. Sometimes some one is up and one is down. That's, that's anarchy. Inherently, capitalism is based on greed. Maybe the intentions that underlie an economic system are the important thing that we ought to look at. If the intention is that we take care of everybody, maybe that's better than having the intention that everybody takes care of themselves. Everybody has to be self-interested. You just look out for yourself, expect everybody else to do the same. Maybe that's a bad kind of moral foundation for a society, perhaps. Maybe if we have a goal of equality, where everybody just takes out what they need from the kind of communal pot, socialism is definitely gonna perhaps get us closer to that. If we have some form of electorally driven socialism, then we get to have elections. Those elections will decide where the product of our labor goes, right? Our communal labor goes. And inherently, all political systems are based on force, all government exists under the implied, you know, the implied threat of force. I, you know, you guys may take some issue with that, but certainly the government isn't the government if it's not at the barrel of a gun to some extent. So if that's the case, why should we use it to support some individual's private interest? It should be for everybody. We should pr pursue the common good. And these are some of the pretty powerful arguments for socialism, but then again, when we look at the cases that we've looked at earlier in the lecture, Cuba, the USSR, North Korea, man, it, it doesn't really seem like people are too happy to live in those societies. It seems like they really want to leave in a lot of cases. You know, people fleeing on life rafts in tractor tires to, uh, to get from Cuba the 90 miles to Florida so that they can live in the United States. Man, that's a pretty compelling argument that maybe socialism's missing something, but maybe we're missing something. Maybe Cuba and North Korea and East Berlin are not really the same thing as what you, you know, as what is talked about when you hear socialism. When you hear that word, maybe you're not thinking about these socialist countries. Maybe there's something else going on.
Democratic socialism. You guys probably heard that term. Well, what is that all about? How is that different than kind of the uh, perhaps more radical form of socialism that we've introduced here? That's a great question. Let's get into it next time.